Facebook Live on Facebook. So welcome everybody on Facebook Live. Uh, I know it's Valentine's Day, so maybe you're going to watch this later or maybe you're watching it now on the way out to have a good time. But thank you for being here tonight and also thank you for watching. And we believe that some great revelation is going to come. This series that I'm ministering tonight revolutionized my thinking. Um, the scriptures actually are, 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 are what changed my heart and mind towards money. And um, it, it's really powerful. So um, lock in with us over the next several weeks. Uh, we're going to talk about get out and stay out referring to debt. Amen. Let's go ahead and bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, we just thank you for this another opportunity to minister the word of God. We believe that lives will be changed as a result of the truths that we will embrace in this entire series. And so as we purpose in our heart to receive direction from you, we ask you to give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation, enlighten the eyes of our understanding. We receive that tonight by faith in Jesus name. And everybody said, amen, amen. So the title of the message tonight, this is the second part of Get Out and Stay Out. I want you to imagine someone in your life or something in your life that you've got to ask to leave. So not only do you want that person or that thing to get out, you want them to stay out. You don't want it to come back and be a reoccurring issue in your life. And so that's what we're telling debt to do is to get out of our lives and stay out of our lives. Our hope through this series of teaching is to cause you to see money differently and then take the steps necessary to get out of debt. And when we talk about debt, we're talking about all forms of debt. I, I don't believe in good debt and bad debt. Some financial people say that good debt is, you know, things that, that assets that appreciate, you know, your house is a good form of debt. Uh, student loans could be a good form of debt because there's some appreciating seemingly. But I, when we refer to get out and stay out, we're talking about being completely and totally debt free. Right now here at Faith Family, we've got a group of almost 40 to 50 people uh, in another part of our building that are going through Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University. He's dealing, he's dealing with the same topic, but from a very practical side, and we're dealing with it from a very spiritual side. But the principles are the same. He's teaching people to get out of debt, cut up your credit cards, and never go back again. He's preaching and teaching how to get to the point where you pay off even your mortgage ahead of time and never be back in the place where you have to go into debt. So we're teaching that from a spiritual uh, concept. The title specifically tonight, what I want to cover, is another question. Last week we asked the question, is debt a sin? Is it a sin to borrow money? Today we want to talk about what if debt was a sin? What if debt was a sin? Turn with me in your Bible, if you would, to the book of Romans, chapter 13, and I want to look at verse number 8. We looked at this as our foundation last week, and we want to start from this solid place today. So Romans 13 and 8 says, To owe no man anything except to love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. Verse 9 says, for the, commandments, for the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. If there be any commandment, are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I think this is a very interesting setup because he's talking about putting yourself in a place where you never owe anybody anything except love. Well, in an immediate sense, when you go to the bank or to the appliance store and you get an agreement, you are essentially signing that you owe them for this particular item. Uh, that organization, that company, behind it is a man. And essentially, you're putting yourself in a borrower's position. And what I believe is that through this verse, God is saying, don't do it. Doesn't matter what they teach in the university, what they teach at the school. Never put yourself in a position where you're borrowing something from someone and there's other scriptures that uh, indicate it. What if he really meant this as he said it? 
Um, I've had ministers, pastors, uh, teachers um, that I highly respect and highly esteem have taught me through the years that it's not a sin to borrow. And uh, even when I introduced the message last week, I introduced it as a thought that I didn't even give you the answer. I challenged you with the thought, is it a sin to borrow? And it's a very interesting thought. And I believe that we should base our beliefs on the word of God, not just on what she said or he said or what I learned at church or what I learned at school. If I can't show it to you in the word of God, then I have no obligation to fulfill it or to live by it. But if I see it in the word of God, then I have every responsibility to walk according to it. So last week we asked the question without answering it, is debt a sin? And through that, I challenged you, and I'm challenging you tonight to make sure you come up with an answer. Don't leave it unanswered in your heart and life. I don't want to shape it. I don't want to put it in your mind and just tell you what that answer is. I want you to go before God and ask him because the answer to that question will determine what you're going to do in the future. Maybe right now you don't have the need to go and borrow for something. But the enemy has a way to create situations in your life that will cause you to be at another crossroad where in order to get this, either God's going to manifest it or I'm going to have to get it on my own. And what I believe God wants is for us to will manifest it. Paul said, my God will supply all your needs. Education indeed will supply the based upon your answer to that question is it a sin to borrow will highly influence your decision the next time the enemy brings about a pressure in your life amen amen so obviously when you ask the question is that a sin obviously most believers and most churches don't believe it is a sin because so many of us are in debt You know, I mean, churches borrow money to build buildings and buy lands and vehicles, etc. Believers, Christians go to borrow for education, borrow for for housing, borrow in different ways. Evidently, if 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 they believe that debt was a sin, then they would intentionally be practicing sin. Right. They would be willfully putting themselves in a position of sin if they believed that it was a sin to borrow and then constantly put themselves in that position to borrow. So obviously most believers in most churches don't believe it is a sin and and obviously so many are in debt. Now we looked at several key passages that could lead us to believe that we're not supposed to borrow. We looked at several key passages of scripture. For example, in the book of Proverbs, it talks about uh, the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is servant to the lender. Well, if you read that properly, in essence, God is saying, don't put yourself in the position of the borrower. Then we looked at twice in the book of Deuteronomy, God said to his people, you shall lend unto many nations, but you shall not borrow. Somebody would take the argument, well, if borrowing was a sin, then God would be causing uh, the children of Israel to cause other people to sin by telling them to lend. Well, number one, if God tells you to lend, then it's not a sin to lend. But if he comes right back after that and says, thou shalt not borrow. Is it a sin then to borrow? I mean, all the commandments that we have been given. And right after Romans 13 and 8, he said, thou shall not murder, thou shall not steal, thou shall not commit. I mean, he's laying out. And if there be any other commandment, thou shalt, thou shalt. The, re, the question then becomes, is borrowing a sin? And, and obviously, there could be indication from the word of God that it indeed could be. I'm leaving it to you to answer that question. That, that particular question. Another one of those powerful passages that we introduce, and we're going to look at these for all the nine weeks that we're going to be in this series. Another powerful passage was Matthew chapter 6. Jesus said that no man can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. 
And when you put yourself in the borrower's position, you are serving money. In other words, most people don't get up and go to work because they want to. They get up and go to work because they got to. Because if they don't, the, 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 the banker is going to take their home because they don't really own the home. There's a lie in America that there is a middle class. There is no middle class. There are two groups in the earth according to the scripture, the rich and the poor. God says the rich rule over the poor and the borrower serving to the lender. So either you are in one category or the other, either you're rich or you're poor. And guess what? If you're rich, you're not going to borrow. And, and rich people understand that because the interest rate eats away. It, it devalues. If you buy it on sale today and you get like half off, but you buy it with a credit card and you don't pay it off, the interest, you'll end up paying for that thing twice. Uh, and, and it just goes on and on depending upon the depth, the depth in which it, you look at it. So God said, Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. He'll hold to the one and, 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 and the other. Uh, and then my favorite of all, I believe, is Romans 6. And we're going to spend some time in Romans 6 tonight. Uh, we won't be before you long. Each one of these are going to be in 30-minute segments. But I'm really challenging you from the Word of God to ask yourself these questions and come up with the, come up with the answers based upon the Word. Amen? Because it's going to shape. You will never live a debt-free life. You may live a comfortable life, but you'll never live a debt-free life if you don't decide at some point in your life that you're done with borrowing. So um, does the Bible outright say that borrowing is a sin? Does the Bible, if you, you know, is there any scripture that says it is a sin to borrow? Now, <laughs> you know, I just read you some powerful, uh, you know, I referenced some powerful scriptures that said thou shalt not borrow. But let's say, you know, it doesn't actually say, you know, thou shalt not borrow. This is a sin, thou shalt not borrow. Um, but the reality of it is, it, the Bible doesn't outright say, or does the Bible outright say that borrowing is a sin? It may not, but I can tell you that it does shape our minds as it relates to the subject. And so I don't want to split hairs. That's why I haven't come out and just said that the answer is, it is a sin. One prophet of God, in whom I highly esteem, said that it would be a sin for him to go borrow for something. Then great men of God, pastors, uh, people I highly esteem, came behind him and said, well, it's a sin for him, the way the Lord dealt with him, it, it would be a sin for him to borrow, but it's not a sin to borrow. And that, leaves a, that could leave me in a state of confusion. Is it a sin? Is it not? Is it okay sometimes? Is it not? Well, if I have good financial management and planning and I don't overextend myself, then it, it, you know, borrowing is actually a way that I could experience God's best in my life by going to the bank and, 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 and being a good steward and still being able to tithe and give offerings, but borrowing is a part. But, you know, that's confusion. Because, for, you know, again, he says the rich and the poor and the borrow and, and owe no man and thou shalt not. And, you know, no man can serve two masters. That's confusion. And so we want to bring clarity and insight from the scripture about this all too important sector. And so this thought came to me. So does the Bible outright say borrowing is a sin, but it does say that thou shalt not borrow. In the same way, the Bible does not outright say smoking marijuana is a sin. Come on, y'all talk to me tonight. I mean, you're not going to read thou shalt not smoke marijuana. You're not going to read thou shalt not smoke in the Bible. Nowhere will you be able to find that. Now, you will find scriptures that talk about your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, and therefore you should glorify God in your body and your spirit. And there's other indications that, that, that what you put in your body can defile your body, and what you do with your body can be even sin. But it doesn't clearly say that listening to Jay-Z and Beyonce and, and Cardi B and I don't know, I'm running out of because I don't listen to them. But it doesn't outright say that these things are a sin. Now, the Bible says that all things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. You know, we need to learn how to rightly divide the word and that then we would be a workman that needs not to be ashamed. It's a shame when you can't pay your bills. 
It's a shame when you find yourself robbing God from the opportunity to bless you because you can't, quote unquote, afford to tithe because you've got to pay your car note or you've got to pay your house note. And listen, when you go to borrow for a house, the bank is not using 90 percent of your income to qualify you for that loan. They say, all right, this is your income and this is your debt load. And so you have you qualify for this. They're using the wrong number if you're a Christian. They ought to be using the 90 percent mark, not that 100 percent. But now you find yourself living from paycheck to paycheck because you've overextended yourself. And listen, if you go to a place and they deny you credit, what that says is they are smarter than you. They calculate that people like you that have this credit score and this this particular income to debt ratio, you're going to be in a situation where you can't afford this. And so we're going to tell you no now for our sake, because we don't want you to default and then we're going to have to chase you down or sell it off to a a, a collection and get part of it back. So they say, you know what, you're not ready to handle this. This ought to be a wake up call for us, y'all. The enemy uses this mammon to keep us from experiencing the life that God intends. So in the same way, the Bible does not outright say that smoking marijuana is a sin, but it does say that your body is the temple. I challenge you again, is it a sin to borrow? Is debt a sin? You answer it for yourself, but do so from the word of God. And if the answer is no, I'm likely to believe that you'll never really experience the freedom that God intends because the enemy will create situations where you're going to open that door again. Here's the thing. What if it is a sin to borrow? What if debt was a sin? What would that change for you? I I, want to ask you, just a couple of you. If it was a sin, if you found out or if you heard or accepted from God that it's a sin for you to borrow to buy a... What would that change for you? If you found out that it was a sin to borrow, what would it change? Before I did it again. I mean, I would avoid it if I could. I would avoid it at all costs. It would totally reshape my mind as it relates to money if I received in my heart that this is not just not expedient, this is against the will of God, and this is going in the wrong direction. There's a scripture, and I want to look it up. Go with me, if you would, to the book of um, Romans 14 and verse 23. It says, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith for whatsoever. This is Romans 14, 23. Whatsoever is not from faith is sin. The Bible literally says that whatever that is not of faith is a sin. Well, when you go to the bank to borrow You're not, some people go in faith to the bank to believe that they will be approved. (laughs) They even put prayer requests in to be removed for the car loan to, you know, to do what God told them clearly not to do. But when you go to the bank, you're going based on your credit ability to be able to pay them back in the future. You're not going in faith. You're going in your own strength. And the Bible does say that whatever is not of faith is sin. It brings again the question, is it a sin to borrow? I wrote this down. Whatsoever that is not a faith is sin. When you go to the bank to get what you need, has the bank then become your God? In other words, you're in a financial spot and you want something or you need something. And as far as you can see, With with what's in your account and what you have in your income, you don't see how you're going to be able to get what you want or what you need. And so the devil dangles. 48 easy payments with almost zero percent interest. 
He dangles it that you can have it now anyhow. And you end up going to the bank, literally to bow before them to get what God intended for you to get from him. Jesus said, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. What a, he also said, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. But here's the issue. When we stand at the doorstep of the home of our dreams with the price tag of $400,000, when we only make $60,000 a year, it looks like Goliath to David. It looks like a mountain that could no way be passable. But Jesus then teaches us to have faith in God, that you can speak to something that's way bigger than you are, and it'll obey you. That's the life of faith that I believe he's called us to live. And I believe that he is daring you and I to live our lives from the perspective that we can one day go into a dealership and offer them cash below invoice because we got cash for it. Forty, fifty thousand dollars, sixty and seventy thousand dollars for a nice vehicle and pay cash for it. That's what Dave Ramsey is teaching people with the debt snowball, how to write down all that you owe. Cut up your credit, card, credit cards so you don't keep, you know, you're paying off this one, but you're making another one. You ain't going, you're running in circle. Come on, you're just running in circle. You're paying off this one and you, open, you do a debt consolidation loan, but then you open up another one. What are you doing? You're just running in place. You're not getting ahead. So what he tells you is cut it off. Stop doing it. Stop doing it. He doesn't teach it as strong as I do from a spiritual perspective and say, ask you and challenge you, is, is it a sin? But he is telling you, don't get out and don't go back. And I'm saying, get out and stay out. Praise God. So when you go to the bank to get what you need, if we as a congregation go to the bank and say, bank, we bow before you. We expose all of our financial history to you with the hope and the prayer that you would be oh so good to us to give us the money to buy these five acres or six acres of land that cost $600,000 and then to build these, these $6 million worth of buildings on it. Oh, bank, will you please, oh, we bow before you. When you go to the bank to get what you need, has the bank then become your God? So tonight the question is, what if it was a sin? What would that change? I believe it will change everything. Because now I'm going to think real hard before I just put myself in that position. And I'm going to make some decisions and do some things differently. Um, so what if it was? So I'm going to take you to one passage of Scripture. If you would go to the book of Romans chapter 6, and there's a lot of verses here. So we're going to look at and then I'm going to end uh, because we're almost out of time. But I really want to walk through Romans chapter 6, and I'm going to interchange sin for debt. And I want you to watch how powerful the application of this passage is from that perspective. Romans chapter 6. We'll start in verse 7. Uh, we'll start in verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Now watch this for a moment. Go back. Again, everywhere we see sin in this passage, we're going to insert the word debt, borrowing. And we're going to analyze what is God saying to us from this particular passage as it relates to debt. Knowing this, this is something that you and I should know, that our old life has been crucified. The old way we used to handle money and use money and buy things and build things has been crucified with, with Jesus so that the body of borrowing, the entity, the instrument of borrowing on credit might be destroyed. 
that henceforth we should not serve debt. Remember what the scripture said, to owe no man anything. Remember what the scripture said, that the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is servant. Remember what the scripture said in Matthew chapter 6, no man can serve two masters. What does this verse say? The verse says that we should get to, in our Christian walk, to a place where we, from this point forward, not serve debt. Man, this is exciting. So let's keep reading. Verse 7. For he that is dead to debt is freed from debt. But if you're still alive to debt, if the idea of borrowing is still alive in your mind, then you're going to be in bondage to debt. You're going to find yourself back in that servant, that slave, that bondage position if it's still alive. But if you decide, I am dead to debt, that's actually one of the sermon series titles of a message is in order to get out and stay out, you've got to be dead to debt. Let me keep reading because I'll run out of time if I do that. So he that is dead to debt is freed from debt. If you ever want to be debt free, you've got to be dead to debt. Here it is, verse 8. Now, if we be dead to debt with the anointed one and his anointing, we believe that we shall also live with the anointed one and his anointing. If I die to debt and say, we're never going to borrow to build a house, but baby, I'm going to build you a beautiful house, then that we're also going to live by that same faith. The next verse, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death have no more dominion over him. When you think about sin, which leads to debt, death, if sin is death, what if it was a sin to borrow? It leads to death, and death will reign or have dominion over you. And that's what people are. People are dominated by debt. It, it has dominion over them. It controls what vacations they take, where they go, what they buy. It has absolute dominion, what they can, you know, have for the future. Next verse, verse 10. I'm almost done. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he lives, he lives unto God. Verse 11. Likewise, oh, this is so good. Man, I just got excited. Look at verse 11. This is what I believe God is challenging you in this series to do. Likewise, in the same way Jesus died, uh, uh, was dead to death and is now alive, in the same way, reckon, which means consider, ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin or debt. Because if, 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 what if debt is a sin? If we're interchanging that word, it says, likewise, reckon yourselves, consider yourselves to be dead indeed to borrowing money. In other words, at some point, you've got to just to die. Debt, the desire, the, 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 the desire to debt has to die. And you've got to consider, I will not borrow anymore. Consider yourselves dead to the ideal of debt and alive unto God through Jesus Christ. In other words, God, I'm not going to bow down at the feet of the bank anymore, but I'm going to come to you when I need. I'm going to be alive unto you. I'm going to come to my Lord Jesus to meet my needs. And if, if God doesn't get, get it to me, then I, don't, I, don't, I won't have it because I'm not going to add it to myself. Um, there's a scripture that says, um, the blessing of the Lord makes rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. Sometimes we buy something and get excited about it, and then we're sorrowful, man, because of the obligation and the dominion. Next verse, verse 12, and this is Romans 6. It says, let not debt, I'm saying sin for debt, let not debt, let not borrowing, therefore reign in your life that you should obey it in the lust of it. I mean, you drive by and you see it on sale and they, you go to, you pull out that credit card, that Macy's credit card, and boom, you know, you just desired to have it, but you couldn't afford it. You were, it, the lust of it drew you. He says, let not debt reign over your life like that, that you should obey it when it says the lust thereof. Verse 13, are you all getting this? This is like, it revolutionized my thinking five years ago. 
And, and, and it's answering the question, what if it was a sin? Then, we sh then the application, we can interchange it. And he's saying, don't, don't do that. Don't let that rule in your life. He says, neither yield your members as instruments of, of unrighteousness unto sin. In other words, don't yield yourself unto debt. You've got to give in to the temptation to borrow for it. You've got to give in to the persuasiveness of the salesperson to buy a $1,500 such, such vacuum. You can do it on these nine easy payments. Don't yield to that temptation unto debt, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness. So in other words, instead of yielding yourself and bowing down yourself to the banker, debt, bow down to God and say, God, what should I do about this project? Verse 14. For debt shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under the law, but you're under grace. You're under God giving you things that you don't deserve. So you don't have to get it on your own. You don't have to yield yourself unto debt. And debt doesn't have to have dominion over you like it used to. Why? Because God gives you what you don't deserve. You're not under the law where you've got to earn it. You're under grace where he gives it to you whether you've earned it or not. Verse 15. I'm almost done. What then? Here's the question. So what now? Shall we borrow money? Because we're not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. That also lets you know if you, if you don't believe that borrowing, is, and there's nothing wrong with borrowing. It's on you. He said, well, sh shall we borrow because we're not under the law? You know, God's not going to force you. To, he's not going to force. That's why I'm glad that we can present it in a question without answering it. Because it's on you. It's on what you believe. You don't need to know what I believe for me and my house. Or what another pastor or another minister believe. What do you believe? And don't blame your belief on a human when you got God for yourself. What then? Shall we borrow because we are under the law? We're not under the law, but under grace, meaning you can do what you essentially want to do? He says, God forbid. No, don't do it that way. And then verse 16, and I'll just stop here. I'm not done. But he says, know ye not. In other words, don't you already know this? That to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey his servants you are to whom you obey whether of borrowing unto death or of obedience he said thou shalt not borrow unto righteousness doing it the right way that verse clinches it for me he says don't you already know this that if you put yourself if you yield yourself as a servant you're going to have to obey them. They will tell you what to do and what you can't do. When you can do it, and if you don't do it, then we're coming to get it. And then now you've got two servants. I mean, you've got two masters. And you're right where Jesus said. He said, don't do that because you're going to hold to one or the other. And there's going to be a situation where you're going to have to choose. Whether it be servants to whom to obey, whether of borrowing Unto death. Did you all know that a mortgage um, has the root of death in it? Like a mortuary, M-O-R-T, mortgage. Some people smarter than me have gotten into the deeper roots of that. But the reality of it is, it's a death note. And when you yield yourself, whether of borrowing unto death, ultimately, you know, if you pay the minimal payment, you'll never pay it all. And it'll just keep increasing. But if you yield yourselves unto obedience, then I'm going to obey God. And that means I went to him and I asked him, is it okay for me to borrow? And he gave me a ton of scriptures. I heard his voice in my heart. 
and I settled it, and I'm going to obey what he tells me to do. So when we need a new house, when we need a new church building, what we're going to do is go to God and say, God, what do you want us to do? We've run out of space in this house. We need a bigger house. What do you want us to do, God? And I'm going to listen to those instructions. And I'm going to obey them. That's what I challenge you to do and to live your life. Tonight's question, what if debt was a sin? What would that change in your life? I want you all to meditate on that between now and next week. Come on back next week. We'll dig into some more of this. And we love you. We thank you. God bless you.